Hi Matrix. Sorry for that disastrous Zoom lesson we had a moment ago. It kicked me out twice and then it also muted me when I expected it didn't. Uh, but we pre-recording the whole of question 2 of the 7, 2017 Feb March paper and uh, that's what we're doing now. Let's go through it. I think Ted was jinxing me. Sorry about that. Question 2. We've already done question one yesterday. So the diagram below represents the human female reproductive system. And um, it's a very easy one to draw. I've previously shown you guys when you draw it, uh, simplify your drawing. It's a very simplified drawing, very nice drawing, and it shows everything that it had needs to show. Then, identify part C. Now, normally when I get to part C, I say to you guys, please call it the birth canal. It's just so much easier to say in class if you say it's the birth canal. But now when I'm checking through the memo for this specific lesson, I've got a bit of a problem. Because they actually telling me in the memo that birth canal is not accepted. Why? Because it's not always a birth canal. If, if a person, um, if a woman never gives birth, that never becomes a birth canal. And so they're saying in the specific memo, you've got to state, and I'm sorry for those of you not taking life sciences because you might not use, be used to this hearing it in a class. Please put in your earphones, watch your other lessons. It is a vagina. And there's no other way to say they're not accepting birth canal for that specific one. Then, question 2.1.2. State one function of part D. Ladies and gentlemen, part D, uh, they're actually not referring to the muscle as such. They are referring to the whole um, structure there. And ladies and gentlemen, that is of course your uterus. Uh, ladies, that's your uterus. Males, you don't have a uterus. Okay, so that is your uterus. Uh, or you can say muscular wall of the uterus, then they have to mark it correctly. But that is the uterus, and so there's various functions to the uterus. It protects the developing fetus. It contracts to push out the baby during birth or during labor, or before birth during labor. And it allows for the implantation of the embryo into this nice big bed, into this vascular glandular lining that we have there. And that is, of course, your endometrium within the, the uterus. And then also it contrasts to push out the blood lining during menstruation. And that's where menstruation pain comes from. Menstruation pain is actually the contraction of these muscles included by the ripping away of this lining on the outside, on the inside, the endometrium lining. Question 2.1.3 is asking us, name the hormone secreted by part B during the first week of the menstrual cycle. So the important here is that they say during the first week of the menstrual cycle, during the first week of the menstrual cycle, ladies and gentlemen, that's going to be estrogen. See, um, after the second week of the menstrual cycle, it's going to be progesterone. So, but in the first week of the um, menstrual cycle, it's estrogen. 2.1.4. State how the hormone name in question 2.1.3 influences part D. Okay, that has to do with the thickness of the endometrium lining. So the thickness of the endometrium lining is going to pick up. So it's going to become thicker and thicker and thicker. Um, as it becomes more glandular, as it becomes more vascular, there's going to be more blood vessels inside it, there's going to be glands inside it, which is later during pregnancy can secrete progesterone. Um, but it's going to become more glandular, it's going to become more vascular, it's going to pull the thickening of the endometrium. And please do use the word endometrium. Um, we can say uterus lining, but guys, we, we far beyond that. We, 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 are, we are on a higher level now, we use the scientific names, we don't use the common names when, when we know the scientific names. Now, next question. Two point, uh, sorry, this, this bell is now going on for too long. Um, during tubal ligation. Now, do you know what tubal ligation is? You actually don't. Um, 
but that's not going to be, you're going to see what it is in a moment. We know it as, a, a, as another word. During tubal ligation, part A is surgically cut or tied. Okay, so let's take a look at, oh, it's the fallopian tube. And the fallopian tube is cut or it's tied up. It's tied up so that sperm cannot reach and go through and reach the egg cell and the egg cell cannot reach the, the uterus. So that's going to cause infertility. So that is a method of um, birth prevention. Okay. So explain how this procedure prevents pregnancy. So sperm cannot reach the ovum because the ovum is coming from the ovaries. The ovum is coming from the ovaries and the sperm cannot reach the ovaries in the fallopian tube to fertilize it. Or the ovum can also not reach, it cannot go into the uterus so that implantation can take place and not even fertilization can take place. Okay, so that's our first question under question two. Second question, an investigation was carried out to determine the effects of smoking during, the pregnancy, during pregnancy on the baby's birth weight. Babies born weighing 2,499 grams, so 2,499 kilograms, or less have a low birth weight. So that's, that's, low, that's classified as a low birth weight. Uh, this comes back into later questions. So uh, remember that now and read very carefully. You've got to read your questions very carefully. The table below compares the percentage of babies of low birth weight born with mothers who smoked and mothers who did not smoke in a certain city in 2009. And as we take a look at the results here, we see that for mothers that smoke, their baby's birth weight, there's a higher percentage of babies that are underweight if they were smoking. Okay, so then they ask you, do I histogram? That's going to be important, histogram. To represent the percentage of births in each weight group born to mothers who smoke. Read the question matrix. I'm going to show you why now. Because what are they asking here? Are they asking all the results? No, they are not. They are asking only those results of the mothers who smoked. Okay, great, Charles. Let's talk about how they're going to mark this graph. Okay, so they're going to give you a mark for your heading. Uh, your heading needs to contain both variables that they are measuring uh, or that they have stated in the investigation, your independent and your dependent variables. So basically it has to contain what's on your x-axis and what's on your y-axis. So the birth weight of the babies um, of, and the percentage of births um, of, mothers of, smoke, um, of the mothers who smoked. Please notice in the question they asked, only asked you to draw four bars, so they're going to give you a mark for two marks for drawing the correct four bars. If you draw the incorrect bar, uh, uh, bars and you draw those mothers who didn't smoke, then they're not going to give you the full marks for that. They're going to give you a mark for the labels. For the labels, they'll give you a mark, uh, but it has to contain the unit and they'll give you a mark for the scale. Then they'll also give you a mark for the fact that it's a histogram, which means there mustn't be any spaces in between the bars. Read the questions very carefully and note what they are marking uh, with regards to the graph. Um, and when you go through past papers, note what they give marks for. Okay, so 2.2.2. Why were babies weighed more than 2,500 gram at birth not included in the investigation? Because they only consider babies under 2,500 grams as being a low birth weight. So they consider normal weight for 2,500 grams. Then, from there, state the general conclusion for this investigation based on the data in the table. Um, so mothers who smoke tend to, uh, their babies tend, uh, pregnant mothers who smoke, tend to have, the babies tend to have a lower birth weight than those who do not smoke. 
Describe how chemicals from cigarette smoke are able to reach the baby's blood from the mother's blood. Okay, so I've got two diagrams here to display. These diagrams are not in the paper, but it shows you the basic structure of the fetus and its surrounding layers. Um, and the, the important thing here is the placenta. If we take a look at the placenta, chemicals can go from the mother's blood into the baby's blood via the placenta. So there's a connection and the blood never mixes. Remember that the blood never mixes people. That's a common mistake people uh, make is that they think that the baby's blood and the mother's blood mix. It doesn't. So I just want to show you something um, quickly. Okay, so when we take a look at the placenta and we imagine for a moment, let me move our computer back here. Um, Teddy is going to help me in a moment when we get to the thyroid camp. When we imagine that this is the umbilical cord, my arm is the umbilical cord going to the baby, and this is the part of the baby that's forming the placenta. This is the part of the mother forming the placenta. The two are in close contact with one another, but they actually the blood doesn't mix. But we find that any, any substances that need to go to the baby from the mother's side is going to be transferred. Any substances like waste products and carbon dioxide that goes from the baby side to the mother then will be transferred to mommy. Okay. Let me share my screen again. So, read the extract below. Um, I'm going to, I'll discuss this question, I've only got so much time left, so I'm going to skip this question for now, um, and I want to get to the thyroid gland question. Okay, no, no let's, let's go, I'll discuss that when I record the video, and I'll send that to you guys. Okay. In a species of sea turtles, the females leave the water to lay their eggs in a nest, on the beach. The, the female makes the nest by digging a hole uh, with her hind legs. A female is known to lay 100 or more eggs. So this already tells me something about the strategy, the reproductive strategy of this turtle. It says to me because of the large amount of eggs that she's laying, what's going to happen is that um, a lot of these eggs aren't going to even make it to birth or they're going to barely be born um, or hatch and then uh, they will not make it to adulthood. They're going to be predated upon. There's going to be very little parental care. And as I said to you with reproductive strategies, what you need to remember is that you're going to spend your energy somewhere. You're either going to spend your energy by making a lot of kids, but you're not going to have enough energy left to take care of them or you're going to spend your energy on um, taking care of them, but then you're not going to have enough energy to make a lot of kids. So it's two strategies. The one is called an R strategy, and the one is called a K strategy. This is called an R strategy. And we're going to see that when we take a look at the graph as well in a moment. After the eggs have been laid, the female covers the nest with sand to hide it from predators and leaves the eggs to incubate on their own. So there's little parental care or no parental care. It takes about two months for the hatchlings to emerge from the nest. The hatchlings must try to make it to the sea safely. Only about 10%, only about 10% of the hatchlings usually make it to the sea safely and survive to reproduce. And then it shows you a graph of the population of surviving, um, of surviving turtles. And then what we find is we call this an R strategy, and we're going to discuss that in a moment as compared to a K strategy, which looks like this, which has more individuals or less individuals being uh, produced, but more of them survive until adulthood. Okay. Right down. Um, whether the type of reproduction in sea turtles is ovipary, vivipary, or over ovipary. So remember, I told you with you, uh, with you guys, please uh, use the O, and that looks like an egg. So O V. That's how you're going to remember. O V. Pari. O V. Pari. 
Okay, Ovipuri, then. Give a reason for your answer in question 2.3.1 uh, because they lay eggs and the eggs hatch. That's why it's oviparine. The shape of the graph would differ if there's parental care. Describe how the shape of the graph would differ if there's parental care. Uh, it would, there would be a higher survival rate. So it would look like the K strategy over here. Higher survival rate of individuals until uh, adulthood. And adulthood is seen as the moment that they can reproduce themselves. Explain your question in 2.3.3 because those babies would be protected against things like predation. They would be taught how, how to get food and where's the best places to get food. And so because there's parental care, there's a higher survival rate until adulthood. Then 2.4, the diagram below uh, represents uh, parts of the human ear, identified parts B, C, and D. Let's take a look. B, ladies and gentlemen, B is, of course, those that's to do with your balance. And so B controls your balance, and we call that part, and now it's on the top of my tongue, I just called uh, the semicircular canals. And uh, remember, you have two parts to the ear, balancing part up top here and a hearing part at the bottom here. The cochlea for the hearing and the semicircular canals for the balancing. Um, people then, B is your station to, uh, sorry, um, question B part C is your station tube, which is, um, it runs right down into your nose and throat area. And it actually is there to balance out the pressure on either side of the tympanic membrane. Um, and this usually gets, uh, this can easily get blocked in small children because it's so narrow by mucus and then cause pressure on the inner ear and then cause middle ear infections. And that's why if, if, a, uh, if a, a kid gets middle ear infections a lot, what we do is we put some grommets inside of our tympanic membrane, our eardrum, to balance out the inner and the, uh, the pressure on the inner and the outer side, of, or middle and outer side of the ear. Then part D, ladies and gentlemen, please, you, uh, it's, easy, it's easy for you to confuse these two little windows over here. The one is called the oval window, and the other one is called the round window, and D is the oval window. Now, and the one below it is the round window. Explain how parts A and D together are adapted to amplify sound. I want you to take a look at the size here. And I'm just going to use another color to show that to you. So if we do that, and that, and we can see if we compare the size of these two, the size of the, the size of the tympanic membrane and the size of the oval window, the oval window is a lot smaller. And because you have that it becoming smaller and smaller, and by the use of these little bones we have that are going smaller and smaller, we are amplifying the waves. We are amplifying the sound. So the function there is to amplify the sound, and it's adapted to amplify sound because the of the size difference between you. the size difference in the, uh, in the surface area between them. 2.4.3, state one advantage of the middle ear being filled with air. If it was filled with fluid, these, um, these ear bones that we have on the inside, in the middle ear, will not be able to vibrate properly. They need to be able to vibrate properly to, uh, to transfer the sound. So it has to be filled with air. Okay, then. 2.5, I just want to double check how much time we have left. And I've got a lot of people who joined after they were kicked off. So I will record the lesson and send it to you guys. Okay. So in 2002, a former American football player was found dead in his truck. 
The doctor who handled the autopsy discovered that the football player had severe brain damage and that his death was caused by repeated blows to the head and repeated concussions. He called the disorder chronic uh, traumatic, uh, and I cannot pronounce that word. Don't ask me, and you don't need to know that word. It's just part of the context that they're using here. A more recent study was conducted which uh, involved the brains of 165 people who played football at high school, college, and professional level. The study found evidence of CTE in 131 of the brains. The part of the brain affected by CTE is the cerebrum. It's going to be important now. State two possible symptoms of the disorder. They don't give you symptoms of the disorder, but they're telling you that it affects the cerebrum. And so they're actually asking you, what is the function of the cerebrum? They're not asking you what is the symptoms. They're actually just bypassing the question and asking you. They want to know what is the function of the cerebrum. And you need to know what the function of the cerebrum is. So what is the function of the cerebrum? It controls your higher thought processes. It controls your memory. It controls your judgment, uh, your problem solving uh, abilities. And then also, it, it is what observes your senses. Okay, so great trials. 2.5.2. State one way in which the brain is protected. Okay, so let me show you as well. So the brain is protected mainly by the skull. Uh, so we've got the skull on the outside and that's protecting the brain. And then right below the skull, we've got uh, membranes. We've got the meninges. And the meninges is to give a space in between the brain and the skull. So the brain doesn't, um, which is soft, doesn't touch the hard skull when we move around. When that does happen, uh, people, we get concussion. We call it a concussion. But the meninges, the three layers of the meninges is what also protects the brain. Um, and you can also name three or three layers of the meninges, which is the pia mater, the arachnoid, and the dura mater. Uh, we can see it's labeled for you over there. And then also there's the cerebrospinal fluid that's also protecting, uh, that's around the brain that is going to protect it. Uh, when we get meningitis, it means there's an infection of the meninges. Um, and so that's where the word meningitis comes from. Also, when you get a lumbar punch, they actually draw some of that cerebrospinal fluid out of the meninges um, to be able to assess if there is any um, viruses or bacteria inside there. So that's why they would take a lumbar punch to see if there's any substances in there that might be infecting it. But this only counts out of one mark, so you can uh, mention any one. So either the skull, the meninges, or you can name all three parts of the meninges, or you can mention that there is the cerebrospinal fluid that acts as a shock, these acts as a shock absorber, so that your brain doesn't touch your skull when it moves inside your skull. Question 2.5.3, explain why CTE does not usually affect essential life processes such as breathing or heart rate. So I'm just going to go and quickly um, switch on my camera here. You just make it a bit bigger for you so you can see properly. There we go. So. There's your brain, and higher thought processes, CTE would affect, they tell you CTE is going to affect your cerebrum, but it doesn't affect your cerebellum, and it doesn't affect your brain stem or medulla oblongata. So that means that my normal life processes is in these areas, not in my higher function where we have the cerebrum so it's in the the lower parts of the brain and that's why normal life processes like breathing is not affected by cte because cte would damage the cerebrum not the cerebellum not the medulla oblongata not the brainstem 
Okay, let's go back to our document. Then, the last question is about the negative feedback loop of TSH and thyroxine. 2.6. TSH and thyroxine are both secretions of the endocrine glands, namely the pituitary gland, the hypophysis, and the thyroid gland, respectively. So while I have the brain here and I have Ted here, I'm going to quickly show you that. So let's go back to our camera here. Okay, so TSH is secreted by my pituitary gland, and I told you guys it's at the bottom of the brain, so I'm just indicating it over there where my finger is now, that's where your pituitary gland. So it's right below the brain. It, um, it, it, it's in close contact to the brain. Then your thyroid gland that is secreting thyroxin. Take come closer here. Okay, so there's your thyroid gland. Okay, so you can see it's a butterfly shaped and that's your thyroid gland and that secretes thyroxin and thyroxin controls your metabolism thyroxin remember controls your metabolism and TSH controls the thyroid gland it tells the thyroid gland to do its job and so that's where the negative feedback loop comes in so let's go back to the paper and note and then I'll show you how this whole system works again just a repetition of what we have already done previously as well when we did the endocrine system and when we did homeostasis. So TSH, th thyroid stimulating hormone, TSH, and thyroxin are both secretions of endocrine glands, namely the pituitary gland, also called the hypothesis. Please don't confuse that with a hypothalamus. That's a different gland. And then the th thyroid gland respectively. 2.6.1 says... Where will you look at the evidence to detect if the levels of TSH and thyroxine in the body? So where would we look for that? Um, in the blood. Hormones are secreted into the blood. They have an organ that produces them. They travel through the blood normally and then they reach a target organ. The target organ in this case is your thyroid gland. And then the organ that is secreting is the TSH, uh, that's your pituitary gland that secretes TSH. Then 2.6.2. .2. A high level of TSH is detected in the human body. That immediately tells me there's problems with the thyroid because the pituitary gland is telling the thyroid, you're not doing your job and then it secretes more TSH just to help it to do its job. And so we know now that the thyroid gland most probably is not doing its job and not secreting thyroxin. So this person is going to have a very low metabolism. Explain two possible causes of high levels of TSH in the body. Okay, so the first one is the fact that um, the pituitary gland is malfunctioning. The, the gland that's secreting TSH is malfunctioning. And that it secretes large amounts of TSH. And what would happen in this case is that I would have a very high metabolism. Or the thyroid gland is not secreting enough thyroxine. And the thyroid gland is not secreting enough thyroxine. And that will then have, a ne uh, because thyroxine has a negative feedback effect on the pituitary gland, telling it, please don't secrete TSH. I'm doing my job. You don't have to tell me to do my job. But if there's not enough thyroxine, that message is not going to get to the pituitary gland and it will start secreting more TSH to try to get the thyroid gland to secrete more thyroxine. And then we're going to have a very low metabolism. Now, we have names for both of these, uh, both of these uh, symptoms. The, if you have a very high metabolism because there's a lot of thyroxine being secreted, we say it's hyperthyroidism. And when we don't uh, secrete enough thyroxine, we call it hypothyroidism. Hyperthyroidism and hypothyroidism. Uh, whether you are secreting too much thyroxine or too much TSH uh, or whether you're secreting too little thyroxine which will also lead to a lot of TSH being secreted because there's nothing to tell it please stop don't tell me to do my job okay so that's question two next question that you'll be doing is question three 
and 4. And then we'll discuss that in tomorrow's lesson that I will send to you. Uh, people, remember you have a test on Monday and next week Friday. Paper 1 for Monday and then paper 2 for Friday.